Transition from dictatorship to democracy will take time, but it is worth every effort. Our coalition will stay until our work is done. Did Saddam Hussein predict the rise of ISIS? Yes. And I even asked him about this, and he just he just kind of laughed. And he said, you know, ugh, these people are my enemies. So today's episode is all about Iraq, and we're going to prepare you for your World War III exam by looking at the fall of Saddam Hussein and what's happened to Iraq afterwards. It's a really fascinating one. Now, if you know nothing about Iraq, it's historically a very significant part of the world. In the ancient world, it was known as Mesopotamia and then Babylon, but during the rise of the Ottoman Empire, it came under their control. When the Ottomans lost World War I, Britain took over Iraq, and it became known as the Mandate of Mesopotamia. This would end in 1932 when Iraq became an independent kingdom, and then in 1958 it would become a republic. In 1968, the Ba'ath Party came to power, and then throughout the 1970s, Saddam Hussein would come to concentrate his power within the party and become the uncontested leader of Iraq. In terms of being a sovereign state, it's actually quite a peculiar one because there are three distinct cultural groups. Firstly, there's the Sunni Muslim Arabs to the West, and this was Saddam Hussein's group, but Saddam himself wasn't actually all that religious. Secondly, there's the majority Shia Muslim Arabs to the East. For context, the Shiite and Sunni Muslims split over who succeeded Muhammad the Prophet as the leader of the original Islamic movement. So though they're both Arabs, Shiite Arabs would see themselves as having more in common with the majority Shiite Persians over in Iran. Finally, there's the Sunni Kurds to the North. We covered the Kurds two weeks back, but basically, though they have the same religion as Western Arabs in Iraq, they don't identify as Iraqi and want their own independent state. Remember this, because if you know this much about Iraq, you're allegedly one step ahead of what George Bush was before he invaded. So America actually came to support Iraq in the 1980s. Over in Iran in 1979, the US Bakshar was overthrown by a radical Shia government that was anti-US. Worried about this fanaticism spilling over to Iraq and concerned about access to the Shat al Arab waterway, Saddam launched an invasion in 1980. The US supported him in this eight year long war, but in 1990, Saddam lost the support of America when he invaded Kuwait. You see, the Iran Iraq war had crippled the Iraqi economy, and control over their rich oil fields was seen as vital for their recovery, especially considering Kuwait was exporting above its OPEC quota, causing the price of Iraqi oil to plummet. So Bush Sr. rolled Saddam in the Gulf War, and throughout the 1990s, America was very hostile towards his regime. They placed heavy sanctions on Iraq, which UNICEF attributed to 500,000 deaths, and in 1997, the International Atomic Agency inspected Iraq and reported that Saddam had all the necessary components for nuclear warheads, and in 1998, ordered Saddam to destroy all nuclear testing sites. So fast forward to 2001 and 9-11 happened, and then on the 20th of September, Bush declared a war on terror, and in 2002 called for an invasion of Iraq. So what did Saddam have to do with all of this? Well, this was Saddam's exact point. Amongst the attackers was a Saudi, an Egyptian, and an Emirati. All American allies and not a single Iraqi was amongst them. In fact, when there was an explosion of jihadist attacks throughout the 1990s, Saddam reached out to the Clinton government to ally against these attacks. As a secular Arab, militant Islamism would do nothing but threaten his regime. So why did Bush invade Iraq? Well, I actually addressed it in this video here, but essentially, he accused Saddam of having weapons of mass destruction, harboring al-Qaeda terrorists, and he framed the invasion as a democratic crusade against Middle Eastern tyranny. In March of 2003, the invasion began, and America even bombed an area south of Baghdad called Jura Farms, believing that Saddam was there. 12 were injured and one was killed, but Saddam hadn't actually been there for a decade. America then used a tactic called shock and awe, which involved avoiding urban cities, expecting to receive support from Iraqi citizens who would see them as liberators. It's also worth noting that Turkey refused access to the American military, and so they changed their plans to invade from the southwest and from Kuwait. For the full picture, I'd recommend watching this video from the Armchair Historian. It truly is an amazing picture of what the invasion looked like. On May 1st, 2003, Bush announced the end of major combat operations. In December of 2003, Saddam was captured by the Americans. Now, because this video is definitely getting demonetized, I'm going to take this as an opportunity to plug the Patreon. For just $1.50 a month, that's four times cheaper than a Club Penguin membership, you can see the face behind the giraffe, contribute to future videos, and help us get towards our goal of having a podcast that covers the important topics of the rise of China, World War III scenarios, and how Australia fits into it all. 
On that note, head on over to Safety Last to check out the two podcasts I recorded with Stanley Ching on pretty much those exact topics. Oh, and we predicted Trump to win 2024. This is probably going to age like milk. So though by the middle of 2003, Bush had declared victory, armed resistance was carried out by Saddam loyalists, but also from the more zealous Sunnis in the West who saw this as an opportunity to create an Islamic state. It's also worth noting that allied Sunni Arab states like Saudi Arabia also did not support the war on terror because of what it could do to Iran. Iran and Saudi Arabia are effectively in a Middle East and Cold War, and so the Saudis feared deposing a Sunni leader and emboldening the Shiite Arabs in Iraq. In the Arab world, a wave of anti-American attacks broke out as America was seen as the enemy of the Islamic world. The suicide bomb tactics were inspired by Hamas in Palestine and Hezbollah in Lebanon, and they targeted UN headquarters, the Baghdad Hotel, police stations, and Iraqis who collaborated with the Americans. I really like this quote from Norman Lowe. Though Al Qaeda fighters were probably not active in Iraq before the invasion, they certainly were in the aftermath. This anger towards the American occupation continued to grow as American companies were being given reconstruction work in Iraq when no other contractors were. The idea that there was more to the Iraq war than just liberation also wasn't helped by the fact that in January of 2003, oil representatives from ExxonMobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, and Halliburton all met with Dick Cheney's staff to discuss the future of post-war Iraq. In 2004, a Shiite cleric in the east, Muqtada al-Sadr, led a full-scale uprising with the goal of establishing a radical Shiite state. So now America had Sunni al-Qaeda resistance in the west and Shiite revolution in the east. To make matters worse, news started to break that the Americans had imprisoned and tortured Iraqi prisoners in Guantanamo Bay. In 2003 alone, 117 Iraqis were transferred there. Now, 2004 was an election year, and with the invasion of Iraq being hated by the outside world and now proving to be unpopular with the Americans themselves, America handed over authority of Iraq to the Iraqis in June of that year. Now, America opted for a system of proportional representation where each of the three major groups were represented in the government according to how much of the population they made up. For instance, the Prime Minister Ayad Alawi was a secular Shiite, the President Ajil al Yawa was a Sunni, and then the two vice presidents were Kurdish and a religious Shiite. The UN put a deadline of 2005 to have democratic elections, but the Sunnis were furious. Remember, they'd lived through decades of Sunni rule with Saddam, and from their point of view, this was another coup, potentially compromising them to Iranian influence. So in December of 2005, Iraq went to the polls, and the Shiite Islamic Alliance picked up the largest share of the votes, while the Kurds were second. However, only 77% of Iraqis voted because many Sunnis boycotted the elections. I try not to editorialize too much, like obviously my biases are often pretty clear, but I am going to editorialize here. The Americans made a huge mistake. A lot of people talk about getting rid of Saddam as the big mistake that completely destabilized Iraq, and I think that's broadly true, but for me, the biggest issue was when America banned his Ba'ath Party and disbanded the Iraqi military in June of 2003, getting rid of his whole apparatus. Throughout 2004 and 2005, before his execution in 2006, Saddam was under the arrest of the new Iraqi government, and very interestingly, John Nixon, a CIA analyst who debriefed Saddam Hussein, has gone on record saying that Saddam predicted the rise of ISIS. Did Saddam Hussein predict the rise of ISIS? Yes. According to Nixon, a strong secular Iraqi government was what was keeping Sunni jihadism at bay. Essentially, the ban of the Ba'ath Party prohibited any party member from future employment in the public sector. But in Saddam's Iraq, there was just the Ba'ath Party. Put it this way, if China was to go through a revolution and the revolutionary government banned any Communist Party member from future office, well then China would lose its entire expertise. Because everyone in the military was part of the Ba'ath Party, they were also dismissed from their post. This then resulted in a lot of angry soldiers joining the radical Sunni groups in the West, particularly Al-Qaeda. These then attacked the new government, and British and American troops were deployed to defend the mainly Shiite government. In 2007, Bush sent more troops to Iraq, bringing the total American force to 150,000. Now, this seemed to work as by the end of 2009, the government reported that civilian deaths were at its lowest level since the invasion. Obama had also come to office, campaigning on a policy of getting out of Iraq, and in 2011, Obama started withdrawing troops into Kuwait. So my subscriber question for you today is not should America have invaded Iraq, the jury's definitely out on that one, but how should America have left? Is there a way they could have done this properly? So literally, just a few weeks after Obama left, the Shiite Prime Minister, Nuri al-Maliki, accused the Sunni Vice President, Tariq al-Hashimi, of organizing terrorist attacks. 
A warrant was issued for his arrest and this caused him to flee to northern Kurdish Iraq. The Sunnis interpreted this as a Shiite and Iranian attempt to rid the government of the Sunnis and responded with a wave of attacks, killing 170 alone in January of 2012. Like I said, many of Saddam's old army had left to join Al Qaeda and Al Qaeda joined forces with a jihadist group called ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. ISIL was led by a guy called Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and the Arab Spring gave him an opportunity to expand his influence. In 2011, a wave of pro-democratic movements broke out across the Middle East, protesting against the autocratic governments. One of those countries was Syria, where a rebellion reformed against its leader, Bashar al-Assad. Seeing an opportunity to expand his influence, al-Baghdadi sent a guy called Abu Muhammad al-Jalani to establish a new al-Qaeda movement in Syria. This was highly successful and they gained territory very quickly, and so Baghdadi merged the two movements to become ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Al-Jalani protested against this, but then Baghdadi attacked his forces and successfully took control. Al-Jalani was furious at this and split off Al-Qaeda from ISIS. So now the borders between Iraq and Syria were very murky as West Iraq and East Syria were under the control of ISIS. ISIS then looked eastward and attacked both Sunni and Shiite areas of Iraq, becoming the dominant force in the country, though it was never recognized as legitimate. In 2014, America committed troops to defeating ISIS in both Iraq and Syria, and Russia devastated ISIS in Syria. In July of 2017, its largest controlled Iraqi city, Mosul, was lost to the Iraqi military. And by the end of the year, it had just 2% of the territory it had in 2015. In 2019, Baghdadi was killed and America once again withdrew from Iraq. And while Iraq hasn't faced the instability of the presence of ISIS, it hasn't exactly been smooth sailing since they've been all but beaten. In November of 2021, they went to the polls, but given the sheer number of parties, no one was able to effectively negotiate a coalition government. But finally in October, that's one month ago from the time of recording, the Iraqi parliament agreed to vote for a president who then appointed the prime minister. Again, it was a Kurd appointed as president and a Shiite as prime minister. So how does this affect World War III? Well, Iraq is very loosely bound together and far from a collective unit. Again, the British drew this map in 1920, and really, there's three units here, each with different allegiances. The Shiites were heavily linked with Iran, though this is much less the case now. The Kurds were obviously linked with the Kurds from Turkey and Syria, and as we discussed last time, the Kurds have recently moved in the direction of Moscow, very reluctantly, out of its disdain for Turkey. Though the northern Kurds have traditionally been US allies, America has simply let them down far too often. And for the Sunnis, well, some are still linked with ISIS and the moderates still hate America for ruining their country and getting rid of one of their own. All this to say that I don't know how long Iraq can actually stay together. And if it does fracture, only the Shia government that's moving away from Iran could potentially bode well for America. If a direct war between superpowers was to break out, a lot of Iraq would be rife for Russian Chinese influence. Thanks for watching, don't forget to like the video and let me know how America should have left Iraq and if you haven't already, you've got to check out this video we made on the Kurds. I referenced them a few times today and America's policies with the Kurds are crucial to understanding the Middle East and the role of Turkey and Russia. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.